So let us start with the chant. Om Bhadram Karne Bhishrinuyam Deva Bhadram Pashye Maksha Bhirya Jatra Sthirai Rangai Tushtu Vagum Sastanu Bhihi Vyashema Deva Hitai Yadayuhu Swastina Indro Vridhashrava Swastina Pusha Vishwaveda Swasti Nastarksho Arishtanemi Swasti Nobrihaspatir Dadhatu Om Shanti 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 We are doing the third chapter of the Mandukya Karika. Third chapter is called Advaita Prakaranam, the chapter on non duality. And we last time we saw the 27th verse, right? We are doing the 27th verse. Sato hi mayaya janma yujyate natu tattvata tattvato jayate yasya jatam tasya hi jayate. So, the way we understand religion is that there is a God who creates us <coughs> and the universe. We sentient beings, we are created by God. So it would be something like this. So there is God or so let's say Brahman, the ultimate reality <coughs> and we individual beings, sentient beings and this, phys this entire universe, insentient universe, has been created by Brahman. In Sanskrit, Jiva and Jagat. Jiva means us, individual beings, sentient beings. Jagat means the universe. That's generally the way theistic religions talk, that uh, God creates everything, all of us and this universe. Now, it immediately leads to a problem. We have discussed this last time. The problem is this, that if God, Brahman, suppose, I'm using the word loosely, God, I'm using the word loosely. Suppose it is the cause. This is effect. Effect means our product. In Sanskrit, karyam, the product, what is made. If this, if this effect is real, then Brahman is really a cause. Karanam, in Sanskrit, Karanam. So if causality is real, really Brahman created this universe, really Brahman has created us. If we are all real products, if we, we all real, seem to be real, if we are really being created, in that case, Brahman would be subject to change. Because nothing becomes a cause really without changing. If Brahman undergoes change, then Brahman will become mortal. It will be subject to you know, the six-fold change we talked about. Um, birth and uh, growth and uh, decay and so on and so forth. So, um, the, and yet we, we know that no religion, let alone Advaita Vedanta, no religion actually says that the ultimate reality, God is subject to change. Uh, God, because nobody would, would be willing to admit that God is subject to death. Uh, no religion says that. And certainly Advaita Vedanta also never says that Brahman would, uh, is in any way subject to change or modification. And certainly the, not that Brahman would ever die or anything like that. So the unchangeable nature in Sanskrit, nirvikara. Unchangeable, nirvikara. And the uh, causality, uh, the unchangeable nature of uh, Brahman and the causality of Brahman, karyatvam. They are incompatible. The unchangeable nature of Brahman, nirvikaratvam, unchangeable. And karanatvam, karanatvam means causality, that it is a cause of this universe. These two are incompatible. Now given that the unchangeable nature, why are they incompatible? Because for something to be a cause, it must undergo change. A seed 
changes when it sprouts into a, a seedling, right? Um, milk changes when it turns into um, yogurt or curd. So Brahman, God must in some sense change in order to produce a real world. Um, since that is not admissible, if the ultimate reality Brahman is unchangeable, then Brahman cannot really be a cause of this world. Not really. But Brahman can apparently be a cause of this world. So the world, Jiva and Jagat, this, the creation of this world, this, this, this effect must be only an apparent effect. Or this is false or mithya. If I say that the cause of the, the snake is the rope, cause of the snake is the rope, I, I'm seeing a snake, but it's actually a rope. The cause of the snake is a rope and the rope did not undergo any change, it's still a rope. Then what kind of snake is it? A real snake or an apparent snake? Apparent. It's a mistake, right? It's a, it's, it's a false snake, it's an apparent snake. If it's an apparent snake, then the, a snake was not really produced and the rope is not really the cause of a snake. So the causality of the rope is false. Rope to remain as rope and unchanged, it cannot really be a snake, it cannot change into a snake. So the rope remaining as a rope can appear as a snake. That's, that's, it can, can appear as a snake, it can be an error. Similarly, if you are asking, what is the nature of this world? What is the nature of this world? What is, what is our nature? How did we originate? Did we really originate from God? Or is God only appearing as all of this? Advaita Vedanta says, God or Brahman is only appearing as all of this. The causality of Brahman is an apparent causality, not a real causality. Karanatvam causality is denied of Brahman. It's not a real causality. Apparent causality is admitted. And it has to be admitted. Why? Because we are seeing this diversity. Where did it all come from? If you say it did not come at all, then, then what accounts for this experience of diversity? It's an apparent thing that the Brahman is, is appearing in these ways. We know from the snake rope example, from the example <coughs> of dreams, that one reality can appear as many. So Brahman is appearing. So this is the Maya idea. So now look at the verse which we studied, 27th verse. Sato hi mayaya janma yujyate natu tattvataha. From sat, from pure being, from pure existence, sat, janma, origination. Origination of what? Us and the universe, jiva jagat. How is it possible? Mayaya. Only by Maya, only in appearance. By Maya means by appearance, by in falsity. Natu tattvata, not in reality. In reality, what if it if this universe were created in reality? What would it mean? It would mean that Brahman actually changed, sat pure being actually changed into jiva and jagat. Um, but that did not happen. So, sato hi mayaya janma yudhyate natu tattvataha, not, not in reality. So, the origination of jiva and jagat is an apparent origination, not a real origination. This is what is called, there is plenty of space, come sit. This is what is called ajatavada. Ajata Vada is his theory of non-origination, non-origination. So this universe of diversity, we are experiencing it and yet we claim that it did not, was not created. Then what is the nature of this university, a universe of diversity? It's an apparent universe. It cannot be a real separate universe apart from Brahman. Now moving on, verse number. 28. I'm just thinking if there's anything else I needed to say in that point. No. 28. 
Please repeat after me. Asato Mayaya Janma. Asato Mayaya Janma. Tatvato Naiva Yujyate. Tatvato Naiva Yujyate. Bandhya Putro Natatvena. Bandhya Putro Natatvena. Mayaya Vapi Jayate. Mayaya Vapi Jayate. So from pure existence, Sat, in Brahman is called Sat here. Sat means pure being. The Sat in, in Sat Chidananda, the Sat. From pure being, only an apparent creation is admitted. Is it possible that all of this has come out of nothing? Two, um, two options are here. One is the Vedantic proposition that all of this has come from pure being. Um, there are, there are two approaches here. One approach is the approach of the dualists, the theistic religions, which say there is God and God has created. There is really God. God really exists and God has really created this universe. So that is the theistic religions, whether it's Christianity or Islam or in Hinduism, many of the dualistic interpretations, Vaishnavism, Shaivism and all of that, really the universe has been produced. And we saw the problems with that. The second interpretation is, that pure being is there alone, non-dual, without a second. A second reality has not been produced. Only appears. Why only appears? Because appearance has to be admitted. We are experiencing this appearance. So that is Advaita Vedanta. Non-dual Vedanta says, Sat alone exists. And it appears as you and him and her and this entire universe. There is another third option which we are talking about now in this 28th verse. The Buddhist school of Shunyavada, the school of the void, um, they say this entire universe is, um, you're right, it's an appearance. And where, did it come, where, it, where does it come from? Appearance of what? This is appearance of nothing. At the heart of all of this is nothing. It's just the void, emptiness. Nothing is there. So this universe is an appearance of nothing. There is nothing there. There is no reality behind it. Now, I'll go into this, what, what the verse is saying, but just as, a, just as a flag warning, this is not what the Buddhists actually say. The Buddhist school of the void, the Shunyavadis, do not say this, really. But this is what um, non-dualists, Advaitins, we have for ages been saying that the Buddhists say this. This is how we have interpreted it. And this you will find in all the traditional commentaries, including Gaudapada. So we interpret the Buddhists as, uh, as nihilists. Nihil means nothing. They are saying there is no uh, reality at all. And this has been going on. The Buddhists interpret us as saying that there is a thing, thing called Brahman. And we interpret, which is not true. Brahman is not a thing. These are things. It's not that there are chairs and tables and there's one Brahman somewhere, no. Um, the opposite is, is that we keep, thinking, we keep saying that the Buddhists say that ultimately there's nothing. But the Buddhists do not say that. Um, what do the Buddhists say? I'll come back to it actually. But let's first see what Gaudapada says about the Buddhists. The classical way non-dualists have painted the Buddhist Shunyavadi, the school of emptiness. So according to the Shunyavadi, emptiness appears as this universe. So did this universe come from emptiness, from nothingness? And Gaudapada says, from nothingness, nothing can be born. From nothingness, only nothing can come. The universe cannot come. A real universe cannot be created from nothingness. Even a false universe cannot be created from nothingness. Notice. A real universe cannot, nothingness cannot produce a real universe. From zero you cannot have something. And nothingness cannot even appear as a real universe. You see, it's only a rope which can be mistaken. A seed can actually sprout into a real, a real seed can sprout into a real plant. A rope can be mistaken as a false snake. See, 
real causality seeds sprouting into plant this is an example of real causality cause becoming effect it really happened the other second second option is something apparently appearing as something else rope unchanged not real cause but appearing as a snake which is the advaita position the first one is whose position the position of theistic religions so dualists the third option is is it possible that there is nothing but a plant sprouts sprouts out of nothing no or is it possible there is nothing from nothing suddenly nothing appears as a snake is it possible no normally something can be mistaken as something else if there is something that can be mistaken as something else there is a sky it's not really blue but we can mistake it as blue there is a rope it's not really a snake but we can mistake it as a snake but there is nothing and that nothing appears to be blue how can nothing be blue there is nothing and it appears to be a snake how can nothing be a snake so gorapada says from nothing from shunyam from the void there can be no real creation there can be no false creation also so this jiva and jagat cannot really emerge from <coughs> cannot really emerge from asat nothing here the word is asat it's diametrically the opposite of sat asat means non existence <coughs> question is can jeev and jagat us sentient beings and this universe can it emerge from nothingness really no really something cannot come out of nothing that's one can it apparently emerge like your you are non dualist say that apparently the you, brahman has become the universe so can apparently nothingness become the universe he says no gorupada says no so from from nothing nothing can emerge yes how can it can't there be a situation where one imagines one projects hmm. i mean at a very temporal level yeah. uh, well i can imagine that uh, say an artist can imagine that there is some kind of a flowers here on the floor true so the artist is projecting his or her true and that so, that would be the projection of the artist's mind yes yeah suppose there's no artist at all <laughs> can there be a conception of a flower was when there is when there can there be a painting without the painter can there be nothing at all which suddenly appears pops into existence no i'll come to you yeah, yeah. Hmm. or illusion anything is possible so hmm. in that case even from nothing something can be created no anything means uh, illogicality is not permitted so something can appear as something else where there is no snake it can still appear that that which is not a snake can appear as a snake a rope can appear as a snake but nothingness it's an illogicality it will it will show um, in fact impossibility is of three types it's impossible to how it can be three types three types one is a technical impossibility so can one go from uh, from this earth to other planets can one go to, travel to other stars if somebody says impossible he means that it's not technically possible now but there's nothing in in uh, in physics which prevents you from going and in science fiction we always are going to other planets sit sit let me finish the three types of impossibility so one is technical impossibility it's technically impossible but in physics it's possible that uh, you can actually go to um, uh, in, in principle it's possible in science fiction it's possible you can go then the second thing is which is physically impossible so it's impossible for light to travel uh, for anything to travel faster than light not only technically but also by the laws of physics it's a more fundamental kind of impossibility the laws of physics as we understand it the universe is such that you cannot actually travel faster than light do you see the difference between the two one is just now we don't have the technology but one day we might the other one is you cannot because uh, physics will not permit it the, the very structure of reality is such it will not permit 
The third kind of impossibility, the real impossibility, is a logical impossibility. Logical impossibility. For example, a square circle. Circle is defined in such a way that it cannot be a square, by definition. <coughs> now, Gaudapada here gives an example. He says, from nothing, a real <coughs> product is not possible. And from nothing, an apparent product is also not possible. From nothing, you cannot have a real world created. Just as from nothing, a real, real sapling cannot emerge. But you cannot have a false world created also. Just as from nothing, you cannot have a suddenly the appearance of a snake. So, and then he goes on to say, he gives an example. And notice the example in the terms of the three impossibilities. The example he says, Bandhyaputra, the son of a barren woman, is not born, really, is not born in appearance also. There can be no son of a barren woman. Barren woman is defined. The moment you say barren woman, that means there is, there is no son. No child possible of a barren woman. It's a logical impossibility. Can a barren woman, there can, can there really, can the son of a barren woman really be born? No. Can the son of a barren woman be born apparently? No. Because the definition is such. Logically. A bachelor by definition is unmarried. Can a bachelor be really married? No. Can a bachelor be apparently married? No. Because you said a bachelor. Bachelor you have said. If you hold on to the meaning of the term, it's logically impossible. So from nothingness, he says, the universe can, this universe cannot really be created and the Buddhist has no objection to that. Because Buddhist says that this universe is also empty. It's not real. It's an appearance. But Gaudapada objects to that also. It cannot be an appearance also. From nothing, nothing can appear. All right. Not even nothingness. Nothingness it cannot appear. appear right? mm -hmm. nothing comes from nothing. In context of imagination, I can even we think imagination cannot be nothing. There is something existence because elephant and abstract artists, when they paint, our mind fails to understand the meaning of that existence of that particular imagination. But the elephant or the abstract artist have something they have in their the photographic mind, some kind of existence. Mm. It cannot be nothing, I think. Mm. Imagination has something. Right. We may not know. The imaginer is there. Mm -hmm. uh, the elements of imagination is there. The sources of that imagination is there. For artist, there's an artistic conception. So that conception comes from certain sources. And of course, the artist has to be there. <coughs> yes. Uh, I'll come to that. But, but let's. I'll come to that. That's a very big controversy. But um, right now, let, I'm just putting forth the uh, classical, the way the Ad Advaitins have normally treated, unfairly, the Buddhist Shunyavadis. Buddhists have many, many schools. They are primarily. For, I'll come to that. Let me finish this one first. What do, What does Gaudapada mean? So. What he means to say, we'll come to that point next, but let's just wrap up this thing which Gaudapada says. So now let's put verse number 27 and 28 together. In 27, he said, from Sat, from pure being, a real cre origination is not possible, but only Mayaya, by apparent, by Maya it's possible. Natu Tattvata, not really. And in 28 verse he said, from nothingness, neither real nor false origination is possible. So, when you put them together, in law you do that, reading this with that, or in bureaucracy, reading this government order with that government order together, you get this. Uh, so, similarly, reading verses 27 and 28 together, what do you get? Remember, what is the question? What is the origination of this universe and us, Jiva and Jagat? Is it a real origination? Is it an apparent origination? So the answer is, it, it has to be an apparent origination. The first 27th verse said, no real origination from pure being. Only apparent origination is possible. 
The second verse said, from non-being, non-existence, shunya, neither real origination nor apparent origination is possible. Now put them together, now we are seeing this universe. So this must be an apparent origination from, from sat, from pure being. Clearly we are seeing it. So this must be a, an apparent origination from pure being. So this is the conclusion he wants to come to. This is called ajatavada, no origination. When no origination is meant, no real origination. The universe was never really created. This is, this is Gaudapada's way of saying, in Advaita Vedanta we say, Brahma Satyam Jagat Mithya. Brahman alone is real, the world is an appearance. So this is how Gaudapada derives it. Um, yes, before we go on to the Buddhism Advaita tangle, yes. Hmm. So is this all Brahman's dream? Yes. That is the the motif of Vishnu dreaming An- Ananta Shayana. He's on his thousand hooded serpent in the in, in eternal ocean, infinite ocean, and he's dreaming. What is his dream? The dream of the is the dream of the universe. So it's a dream in the cosmic mind, you can say. Yes, that's one way of understanding it. By the way, I was reading this book, Jim Holtz, Why Does the World Exist? And so there he says, can something come out of nothing? Well, in mathematics it can. So if you have zero, zero is nothing. So you have only zero. So can something come out? Yes, zero is also minus one and plus one. As long as you have minus one, plus one, it's still zero. Then you can have minus one and minus two and minus three and plus one and plus two and plus three. What's the total? Zero. You can have the entire range of positive integers and the entire range of negative integers. And what's the total? Zero. Zero. Some of you are still a little weak in mathematics. (laughs) (laughs) The whole thing is zero. So you can have entirety of positive and negative integers, infinite number of integers. And you can do your mathematics with it. Addition, multiplication, subtraction, division, all of that. And still it would be zero. So, yeah, in that sense. So this is a thing to think about. But remember, mathematics is still a human activity. It requires you to think about it this way and formulate it. So you are, you are still there. That's why you are able to do this kind of mathematics. It's not that zero means nothing at all. Okay. Now we'll go back to that question about... It's one of my favorite questions. Why? <laughs> because I did my dissertation on this when I was a novice, a brahmachari. We had to do dissertations on different subjects. So my dissertation was on... Um, Advaita Vedanta and Madhyamaka Buddhism. So what's it all about? Very quickly, let me quickly summarize the whole thing. Buddhism has many schools. Just as Orthodox Hinduism has many schools. You know, ancient schools of Hinduism, the Nyaya, the Vaisheshika, the Sankhya, the Yoga, the Purva Mimamsaka, and the Vedanta. Uh, these are all ancient schools of Hinduism. And of course, many other schools. The Tantra, uh, the various schools of Tantra and so on. Buddhism, many schools, we, at, in one account we find 18 different schools of ancient Indian Buddhism, but primarily four schools, four schools. Sautrantika, Vaibhashika, Vijnanavada Yogachara and Shunyavada Madhyamaka. The first two, Sautrantika and Vaibhashika, need not concern us here. They are the foundations of what is called Theravada Buddhism. So the Buddhism you find in Burma, you know, from where mindfulness, meditation, all of this has come from, Vipassana, Burma, and uh, there's Myanmar, and Thailand, and uh, Southeast Asia, and Sri Lanka, that is Theravada Buddhism. Theravada comes from the term Sthavira. Sthavira means the elder, the way of the elders, the way of the elders. So they consider themselves to be the original school of Buddhism, uh, Theravada. It is often known as Hinayana, the lesser vehicle. But that's only by those who oppose it because nobody would call themselves a lesser vehicle. (laughs) So they call themselves the Theravada, the way of the elders. As against this, the other two schools which concern us here, Vijnanavada, Yogachara Vijnanavada, that's one school. That is called in English, it's called the mind-only school. 
the mind it's very evocative what is this entire universe it's mind only and the shunyavada what is this entire universe emptiness so these two schools they form the basis of what is called mahayana buddhism so the buddhism you find in china you find it in korea and japan mahayana buddhism so underlying philosophy is this emptiness or mind only philosophy both of them so the special buddhism you find in tibet dalai lama um so tibetan buddhism the fun, the underlying philosophy is a combination a synthesis of mind only vigyanavada and uh, the emptiness school the school of the void shunyavada shunyavada means the way of the void emptiness so these are the four schools one thing i'll just mention here these four schools they are classified according to epistemology really the theory of knowledge it works like this the question asked is what is this universe which you are seeing this universe which you are seeing means experiencing what is it what's its status um four answers these four schools give four answers then by these four answers you can see the difference in the four schools the first answer is given by the sotrantika who says directly we are perceiving the universe so there is a table chair human being there and we are actually directly seeing it so we are directly experiencing the reality outside yes the reality is momentary ever changing whatever the buddha said but we are directly experiencing the reality there is a pen and i'm seeing a pen this is sotrantika bahyarthavadi that means there is a real thing outside you which you are experiencing so they are in one sense realists the second school vaibhashika says no 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 what you are experiencing the pen which you are looking at right now does not exist outside your mind the pen um, what, what you are seeing is actually uh, no let me re- rephrase that what you are seeing now is a representation of what exists outside in your mind which is what modern science would say actually so what they are saying is there is something outside and that information is collected by your senses and then that information is recreated in your mind and that recreation is what you are seeing so you are seeing a representation of the world outside in your mind and that's what modern science actually says how are we seeing this universe seeing hearing smelling tasting touching it's all data from outside collated collected organized filtered by the brain and then presented somehow big question somehow a uh, hard problem of consciousness how it is presented to us so this is called in modern philosophy it's called representative realism it's a very modern school modern way of looking at it in 20th century philosophy of course we call it representative realism the earlier one is called naive realism or direct realism so we are very proud of it representative realism <laughs> not remembering that 2500 years ago in, in india they were t- talking about exactly the same thing about 2000 years ago the schools came a little after buddha 20 centuries ago <laughs> and in a much more sophisticated way than you will get in textbooks of representative realism today now this is the second school the third school vigyanavada the mind only school comes and says how do you know what you are seeing is a representation but how do you know that there is something outside at all if there is something outside you have no access to it so there are only minds in minds this world is imagined so the world exists what you are the same question what i was it what is it that you are saying first school said there is really something which you are seeing second school said what you are seeing is a copy a representation of something outside third school says there's nothing outside it's only in your mind so the entire universe of experience is in the mind only we'll see some similarity in the next verse here that's why often people confuse this with advaita vedanta it's in the mind advaita doesn't say that advaita says it's a projection by maya in brahman not in our individual minds our minds are also projections anyhow this vigyana or the school mind only school says the world outside is there's no world outside it's entirely a projection in your mind and the last school the shunyavada says the world outside is no world outside it's emptiness 
and there is no perceiver that mind also is emptiness. It's outside, inside, it's emptiness alone, shunyata. The emptiness of the world, emptiness of the perceiving person also. So that is the truth. Now, so these are the four, four approaches to uh, reality or to the experience of reality. So these are epistemological approaches. These are the four schools. Now, what does, uh, we are concerned with the last one, fourth one. Its name is Madhyamaka Buddhism. And that comes from Nagarjuna, a great philosopher who is present day Andhra Pradesh in, in the south of India, who lived about 700 years before Shankaracharya, 600 years before Shankaracharya, about 100 AD, around that time. And he wrote Mula Madhyamaka Karika, just like Mandukya Karika of Gaudapada, he wrote Mula Madhyamaka Karika, the root verses on the middle way, Mula Madhyamaka Karika, which became the foundation of the school. So it's a great, wonderful text. I studied it about 20 years ago uh, in our uh, training center. It's a masterpiece of logic where he proves the, what he says, shunyata sarva drishtinam, the emptiness of all philosophies. So that is the emptiness school. Now what, is, what we are concerned with is, he clearly says that we are not talking about nothingness. What we are talking when we say shunya, void. This is what we are concerned about now, because this is, goes against what Gaudapada just said. When we say shunyata, void, we are not talking about nothingness, we are not talking about asat. What, Gaudab, what Nagarjuna says, what is the reality? Is it something that exists? He says there are four possibilities. It is Follow this, it's called Chatushkoti, four possibilities, Nagarjuna says. It is, then second, it is not. Third, it is, it is and it is not, both. And fourth, it neither is, neither is not. So four possibilities. One is positive, one is negative, one is the conjunction, and one is the denial of that conjunction. So four possibilities, he says. These are four possibilities. It means what? Anything. World. Does the world exist? He says there are four possibilities. Yes, the world exists. Second, no, the world does not exist. Third, it exists and does not exist in some sense. Fourth, it neither exists, neither does not exist. <laughs> these are the four possibilities. So what, is, what are you saying? Nagarjuna says that none of them are correct. He says, is it true that it is? He says, no. Is it true that it is not? He says, no. Is it true that it is both and is and is not? No. Is it true that it is neither and uh, it, it is not and, and it is also uh, I mean, not true that it is not? He says, no, not even that. So, for example, the world, is it a reality? First option, Sat. Second, is it unreal? Asat. Third, Sat plus Asat. Is it both real and unreal? And fourth, is it neither real uh, and, and, ne and not uh, unreal? Uh. What does he say? He says, is it something that exists? This universe, he says, no. Is it something that does not? Then you are saying it not, does not exist. He says, no. So it both exists and does not exist. He says, no. And he says, so it neither exists, neither does not exist. He says, no. Then what? Chatush koti vinir muktam tattvam. The reality is beyond the four alternatives. The reality is beyond the four alternatives. And what is it? Can't be spoken. Can't be said. What can be said are these four. And notice the second one. This is what we are saying. They are, that according to the uh, classical uh, non-dualist Advaitins, we are saying Buddhists say the world does not exist. But Nagarjuna specifically denied that. He said, I'm, we are not saying that. And in fact, in a separate verse in the Mula Madhyamaka Karika, Nagarjuna clearly says, that those who charge us with being nihilists, 
that saying asadvadi that means there is there's no, no reality they do us an injustice we don't he there is a specific verse to that effect he knows that this this charge will be laid at his door because we are not speaking about that and then he goes further he says yatha sarpo durgrihita those who oh that, that, i'll come to that next so these are the four alternatives and he says chatush koti vinir mukta tattvam gorapad also somewhere later in the text he says what is brahman chatush koti vinir mukta tattvam so these apply to brahman as well yes but see didn't you just say brahman is sat but sat here means an existing thing something which exists brahman is not an existing thing oh so brahman is non existent no it's not a non existent thing also so it both exists and does not exist no that's impossible how can something exist and non it's mutually contradictory so it neither exists nor does not exist no not even not even that what do you mean brahman is not an existing thing it's like saying gold is an ornament no gold is not an ornament there is a necklace there is a bangle and there is a tiara they are all made of gold and somebody says the reality is gold also oh, gold is a fourth kind of ornament no 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 gold is not an ornament it is not a thing which exists not an ornament which exists so gold does not exist that's ridiculous it's only gold which exists so gold both exists and does not exist no that's not true so gold neither exists nor does not exist no that's not true either you can easily understand it's not very difficult to understand if you apply it to the fundamental reality that's what nagarjun is trying to say the way to reconcile these two approaches in my view my, so now what what is the view of um scholars all over the world i'm trying to understand uh, answer your question what is the view of scholars all over your of the world about this the traditional scholars of uh, vedanta not only advaita vedanta the other hindu schools they all try to say that buddhism says especially in shunyavada says this nothing there's nothing ultimately it's all empty but clearly we saw buddhism doesn't want to nagarjuna says no 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 we are not saying that and uh, the classical buddhist scholars i've ta- spoken with some of them tibetan buddhists for example they keep saying that hindus say that there is some separate thing called atma which is not which is what a nyaya nyayika or a dualist dualistic hindu might say but we don't say that we don't say that we don't say that there is a thing called brahman rather brahman is the existence of all things pure being we we don't say that there is a body and there is a mind and there is a third thing third component you can separate them and put them on a bench separately no not like that so this is the view of two classical um, most of them so most of them when you find nearly 2000 years of texts the attacks of the hindu texts on on the buddhist schools uh, those attacks are usually they will portray the buddhist as asadvadi the ones who say that ultimately there is nothing shunya means nothing and if you look at the buddhist responses they portray the hindus as saying that atma or brahman is a thing and they can't prove that there is such a thing the conciliation in the in recent times for example in our order swami um, saradananda in his book the great master he says what the buddhists call shunyam we call purnam what they call emptiness we call fullness gold in itself is not an ornament can you say the gold is the emptiness of all ornaments it's empty of all ornaments you can say that but at the same time can you say gold is non existent no no gold is the existence of all ornaments gold is the fullness out of which comes all ornaments but if you look at look if you're looking for an ornament in gold you will not find any ornament at all gold in itself is empty of all ornaments but it is the possibility of all ornaments in one sense its fullness so the void in one sense is empty empty of what the universe but it's also infinite fullness out of that alone comes the entire universe so sharadan ji says what we call purnam the full the complete the whole they call shunyam empty um swami vivekananda also was of this opinion 
that ultimately what the Buddha was saying and what Advaita says is the same thing. Uh, he, he says in one place very dramatically he says this philosophy of Advaita has saved Hinduism or has saved India two times in the past. Once he means I think during the time of, of the uh, Gita and all of that and the second is in the time of the of Shankara and uh, who teaches Advaita uh, when Buddhism disappeared. Oh, first he means at the time of the Buddha. He was taught by the Buddha. And then he says at the time of Shankara. And then he says third time again, it is Ramakrishna and I who have come to give this to the whole world. I've forgotten the exact words. And there are modern scholars like T.R.V. Murthy, like Dr. Radhakrishnan, who were of the view that Advaita Vedanta and the Madhyamaka Buddhism, Shunyavada Buddhism, they, are, they basically mean the same thing. In the Brahma Sutras, written by Shankaracharya, Brahma Sutra Bhashya, the commentary on the Brahma Sutra written by Shankaracharya, when he takes up different schools and refutes them from the point of view of Advaita, he refutes the Vijnanavada, mind-only school of Buddhism, page after page, cuts it down completely. Then he comes to the emptiness school, Shunyavada school and spends just one sentence over it and then quickly moves ahead. People are suspicious. What happened? This is the most powerful and most sophisticated school of Buddhism. And yet Shankara sort of just glides over it. What he says, one sentence only. He says, Niradhara Brahma Navayam Mangi Kurmaha. We do not accept error without foundation. False snake without a real rope. There is a lie, a falsity, and there is no truth underneath that. We cannot accept that. So the world is an appearance. Appearance of what? Of a real Brahman. So if you are saying that this world is emptiness, appearance, what is it at the basis? No adhara, no basis, no foundation. That we cannot accept. And by just saying that, he moves ahead. Whereas in the earlier case of the Vijnanavadi, he had spent page after page to refute it. One theory is, why did he do that? Uh, he says, because his school is, his teaching of Advaita Vedanta is so close to the Shunyavadi that he dare not investigate in too much behind it. Because then Advaita will pop out of it. <laughs> That's one, one theory. Um, so I'm also of the opinion that both of them, they say the same thing. And interestingly, modern scholars here in the United States, and I've seen teachers of Tibetan Buddhism especially, American teachers of Buddhism, not Tibetan not Indian. So when we are removed from our very ancient hostilities, 2500 years of combat, uh, intellectual combat, gladiator <laughs> intellectual <laughs> debate, when they are removed to an entirely different location, I mean when there are people coming to these ancient traditions free of those preconceived biases. I have, I have had at least two or three, just yesterday one teacher uh, of uh, Tibetan Buddhism, and a few weeks ago, another teacher of Tibetan Buddhism, well known, they, they have worldwide followings, but the Americans. They have written to me, what you are teaching is exactly what we teach in Tibetan Buddhism. One actually proposed that we should have a joint uh, class teaching. Uh, he has books on Tibetan Buddhism, an American. So when you look at it with an unbiased mind, not clouded by 20 centuries of warfare, <laughs> I mean uh, intellectual warfare, you begin to see this basically they're like a mirror images. They're saying they're exactly the same thing. One Tibet, young Tibetan nun uh, in a Tibetan Buddhist nun, I, I met in the World Parliament of Religions. She came excitedly and she said, Swami, I've seen your videos. In our tradition, with which the things, is the core, they call them core, the, the pointers, for which we have to wait for years to be initiated into that. You're just openly giving those things out. <laughs> what you're saying in your... This is what we have to wait for multiple levels of years of training before we are actually exposed to those teachings. So it is the same thing. Yeah. That's my, my view. How do you reconcile the idea of thing, nothing and no thing? Yeah. This is how, how I put them together. Thing. Is the ultimate reality a thing? Buddhism says no. Can it be nothing 
Advaita says, no, it cannot be nothing. It is no thing. It's not a thing, not an object. Not an object. It's not emptiness either. Emptiness in the sense of nothing. But it is no thing. That no thing applies equally to the Shunya of the Buddhist and to the Brahman of the Advaitin. I'll come to you. One more point from Nagarjuna. Hold on to your question. So is the Shunya the ultimate reality? Is Shunya some, something real? And Nagarjuna says, Yatha Sarpo Durgrihita. Those who take the Shunya to be another kind of reality, for them there is no hope. He says that's only a method of dissolving your grasp upon this as a reality. So he says like a snake mishandled. If you hold a snake at the wrong end, it will bite you. So if you take Shunyavada as teaching another reality called Shunya. No. It is just a te technique of letting, you, letting go of your grasping onto this world and onto this body-mind as the reality. Yes. I guess it's just related to... Okay. Uh, Which one? Which distinction? A transactional reality. Oh, this idea of ultimate reality and transactional reality. Paramarthika and Vavaharika. This was actually introduced by Nagarjuna. 700 years before Shankaracharya. Nagarjuna said there are two levels of truth. This two-tiered idea, it comes from the Buddhists. That's why the other schools of Hinduism charge Shankaracharya with being a Buddhist. Because he sounds so much like a Buddhist. That also should tell you something, that Advaita and Tibetan Buddhist, or Advaita and Shunyavada are not very different from each other. When the, the Hindu opponents of the Advaita, the dualists, they charge us with being Prachanna Bauddhaha, crypto Buddhist, <laughs> you are hidden Buddhists. Yes, that's true, because uh, there are so many similarities. That idea of two levels of truth, ultimate reality and apparent reality, that comes from Nagarjuna. <coughs> About 700 years before Shankaracharya, um, in the Mula Madhyamaka Karika, Nagarjuna said the Buddha taught two levels of truths or two truths. And he says, Paramarthika Tattvam, uh, Paramarthika Satyam, and then Samritti Satyam. Instead of saying Vavaharika transaction, he says Samritti, apparent reality. And not only that, in very simple and direct Sanskrit, he says, What is the need of this? If the ultimate, what is, according to him, ultimate uh, truth is shunyata, void, emptiness. And this apparent reality is this. We are here and Buddha is the teacher and we have to learn and all of this is apparent reality. And you have to come to the class, so this is apparent reality. And he, he makes a very beautiful statement. Samritti manashritya paramartham nadhigamyate. Without taking the help of this apparent reality, none will reach to that ultimate reality without taking refuge in this apparent reality. Refuge means take refuge in the Buddha, in the teachings of the Buddha and practice it. Then only you will transcend both Buddha and Buddhism, he says. There's a whole, one chapter on, in Mula Madhyamaka Karika, there's one chapter on the emptiness of Buddha. Buddha is also empty. <laughs> and he has this logical, it's called, in, in modern language it's called uh, tetralemma. He puts all philosophies in this matrix and then cuts it down. He says, any philosophy you give me, he says, shunyata sarva I will show you that it's empty, it's, not, it's, it's wrong, it's basically wrong. Any philosophy that you give me, it's wrong. All, philosophy, all philosophical views are empty according to him. So somebody asked him, so if a, whatever any philosopher says is wrong, then what you say is also wrong. You're also a philosopher, what you're saying is wrong. His answer is very interesting. He says, whatever anybody says is wrong, I can show that to you. And, and if I said something, it would be wrong, but I don't say anything. <laughs> if I stated a position, then it would be wrong, but I'm not stating anything. <laughs> so it's not wrong. Yeah. By, by, by which well, he means that what he, he ultimately wants to point out, not state, point out, is beyond language. Yes. I, and I, uh, apropos of that, I'm having trouble with definitions 
and logic, in the sense that if you define Brahman as being without cause and not causing anything, hmm. then the world logically does not exist. Hmm. But if you if you but you're going further, we are, and, and by defining it as not this, not this, not that, and not the other either. No, this, further, this, we are not talking about it. I'm just, I just brought it up because it's not part of the text. I just brought I it up because of Buddhism. Yeah. I understand. But you also indicated that this Shunyata... It will apply, apply to Brahman apply. also. So you're defining it. These are definitions. Hmm. This is not this, not this, not this. Yeah. But further, we are saying, and by the way, you puny human being, you cannot understand where it is. That no, who said that? You just said it. I never I said. said it. I, 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 I never said such no, a thing. No, no, I know you didn't say yeah. that. But it's, 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 it's beyond Bakuman. human knowledge. It's, it's Nobody said that. <laughs> How can it be beyond you? You are it. You're talking about <laughs> this. Is, this entire thing is about you. You are nowhere. Neither Nagarjuna nor Shankara will ever say you puny human being. You can never understand. Not at all. For, from their point of view, you are not a puny human being. Shankara would say you are Brahman, Jiva Brahma Iva Napara. And Nagarjuna would say that you are Buddha, Buddha, you are none other than the Buddha. Your own, you have the Buddha nature within you. So you cannot understand this by putting it in any of these categories and objectifying it. But logic is our part of the human mind. Yes. So, so we are trying to apply logic. To yes. It. Now if you say you cannot understand it by the human mind, that's correct. Because understanding by the human mind is in these categories. And it, it, is, it goes beyond these categories. So it, it's not something that you can understand with the human mind. But it is, is it beyond you entirely? Not at all. So when Vivekananda says, it is unknowable by, by the human mind, but don't go away by thinking that the Brahman is unknown. It is more than known. It's not only not unknown, it's not even known, it's, no, it's more than known. It is you yourself. The Keno Upanishad, when it talks about Brahman, well, look at the language it uses. Um, na tatra chakshur gacchati na vag gacchati na umanaha na vidmo na vijani mo yatheita danushishyad please teach me Brahman and the, and the teacher is well um, it is beyond na chakshur gacchati it's beyond the eyes you cannot see it that means it's beyond the senses none of the senses can objectify that ultimate reality all right but we can describe it, right? Without actually seeing it. The Navagach, it is beyond speech. No language can capture it. Alright, but we can understand it. Na beyond manaha. Logic. It's beyond logic. Beyond logic. Na manaha. Mind also cannot grasp it. Beyond logic. You can neither use the mind or logic to understand it. You can neither use speech to describe it. Uh, the most sophisticated, maybe mathematical uh, logic. No. And of course, it's beyond the senses. So how will you teach it? And the teacher says, Navidmo Navijani Mo Yatheita Anushishya. We don't know how to teach it. We don't know how to teach it. The student is scared. He says, just a minute, I've invested one and a half years coming to this class. So <laughs> tell me, uh, at least you know it, right? You can't teach it, but you know it. Navidma, we don't know it. I don't know. And you can imagine the student getting up and sort of throwing up his hands and rolling his eyes to up and think, I'm going to walk out. And the teacher says, wait, wait, there is a way, there is a unique way. By saying all this, he has, what has he denied? It cannot be taught like anything else is taught. In a classroom, demonstrated, it can't be done like that. So you know it. No, I don't know it by what you think by knowing, not in that way. Next is, so it's unknown then. No, it's not unknown either. More than known. The next mantra is very interesting. He says, Anya deva tadvedita datho avidita dadhi iti shushruma purvesham ye nastadbya chachakshire There is a way. It is the way of the ancients, the way we have been instructed. And it worked for us, we, meaning we became enlightened. Purvesham yenatatat As the ancients have instructed us. That one I can try on you. And see if it works. There is a way. What is that way? He says, that which you are looking for. It is ad anya devatad viditad. 
it is other than anything that you know. Whatever you know, it's other than that. So it's unknown because our whole universe divides neatly into two things. That which we know, it's a tiny slice and the rest of it is a vast unknown. So it's not within that tiny slice, it's not known. So it must be somewhere in the unknown, right? He says, Atho avidita dadhi, but it's beyond the unknown also. Whatever you know, Brahman is not that. Not only that, Brahman is not what you know, it's not that. Whatever you can know also, Brahman is not that. Did you see it? Yes, not Brahman. Did you read about it? Yes, not Brahman. Did you understand it? Yes, not Brahman. So immediately we think that, oh, so it's something unknown and unknowable. And it says, not that either. Neti neti. Neither this, not that. But there is, then within, what do you mean? It's just trying to be paradoxical. Not at all. It's a very powerful way of pointing to one thing. What is the one thing which is other than all that you know and all that is unknown? You yourself. You yourself. Is it you yourself? Are you an object that you know? You yourself. Are you an object that you know? No, you are not, not very sure. <laughs> Notice about yourself, whatever you know as an object. Is it the body or the mind or your own story? Those are all objects. That's not the Atman. And the Atman itself, can you say it is unknown? Can you ever say that you do not know yourself? No, you're always there. You're always present to yourself. What is that one thing? That isness, that awareness, which is not an object which you know, which is not an object that you do not know either. If you keep applying that consistently, it will drive you to that intuitive grasp of what you are. See, that's the thing. So intuitive realization, right? That's a super rational, isn't it? Beyond the logic, beyond any rationality. True. But remember, in Advaita Vedanta and Shunyavada Buddhism, they are hyper-rational and hyper-logical. Advaita Vedanta and, uh, and also Shunyavada Buddhism, the way they do it in Tibet, it is more, I will say with confidence, it's more rational than science. It is, the path is entirely rational and mercilessly so. Hold on to it, your experience and logic. But when you, it will ultimately take you to something where you have to take an intuitive jump. That's the jump, yeah. Huh. But if you say then, I will not be rational, I will be irrational, illogical, finished. There is no way for you. You will be sunk in superstition. Far better than that to be a materialist, scientist, uh, you know, reductionist. This is fiercely logical. Not one thing will be said here which is other than logic. And finally it will drive you to a point which logic cannot demonstrate. But you can see within yourself and it is absolutely clear. Anyway, so this is the way to put it. Okay, let's move ahead. So this is about Buddhism. But what Gaudapada wants to say here is, this universe, you and the entire universe, you are not a real product of Brahman. Huh? You are an apparent product of Brahman. From non-existence, this you and the universe can neither really be produced nor even apparently produced. So the only ultimate conclusion of all of this is, there is Brahman which appears as this universe. And that Brahman is neither a cause nor an effect. Karya Karana Vilakshana Brahma. Okay, now let us move ahead. 29. Actually, 29 and 20, 30 should be read together anyway. Again, reading together. 29. Yatha Swapne Dvaya Bhasam. Yatha Swapne Dvaya Bhasam. Spandate Mayaya Manaha, Spandate Mayaya Manaha, Tata Jagradvaya Bhasam, Tata Jagradvaya Bhasam, Spandate Mayaya Manaha, Spandate Mayaya Manaha. Just as in your dreams, the mind alone, by its by sheer Maya, the mind alone vibrates as the dream world. 
mind alone vibrates as the world of, of millions of entities in your, in your dream. Similarly, in this waking world also, it is the mind alone which vibrates by Maya as this entire universe, waking universe. I'll explain. Simple verse. It says, dream. As in the dream, what happens in the dream? All the people that you see, all the places that you see, uh, all the time that has passed in the dream. You must have heard the story of Narada, how 12 years passed. All the time that has passed, all the places that you see, all the people that you see in the dream, all the events that happens, uh, all of that is nothing but your mind, the dreamer's mind. When you wake up, you realize that? It is just the, spandati means vibrates or shines forth. It is the mind alone which shines forth as the entire dream universe. The space, the time, the people, space, time, object, desha, kala, vastu, all of it is just one thing. Similarly, it is just one thing here. Brahman, through Maya, are you Brahman, you, you as existence, consciousness, bliss, shining forth as this universe. This entire multiplicity is nothing but Brahman. It is Brahman alone. Just as everything in the dream you see is you, similarly, everything that you see here is you. But you, which you? Brahman. Body you? No. Mind you? No. <laughs> Mind you. <laughs> Brahman. No. Brahman you. The you, the you as Brahman. Um, one of the traditional scholars, he has explained it. The language is so nice. I, I, sh I felt I should quote the original to you and translate. It's in Hindi. It's a commentary on this verse. It's by a Swami who passed away in the ninth, I mean, uh, it was in the early 20th century, mid 20th century. Very powerful writer, but his writing is all in uh, Hindi and Sanskrit. So. so this thing he's explaining. I'll read it out to you in Hindi and then keep on translating. So this, so the grand conclusion is this, just as you're seeing so many things in the dream world, but it's just one mind vibrating in so many ways. You're seeing so many things now, it is just one thing, Brahman, your real nature. He says, Jaisa hai vaise, exactly as this world is, just like that, without changing anything here. Sote vie Brahma, in, when you are asleep, it is Brahman alone. Jagte vie Brahma, when you are awake, it is Brahman alone. Uh, bathroom me Brahma, that is it. <laughs> in the bathroom, he's trying to be shocking. In the bathroom, in the, in the toilet, it is Brahman alone. I remember when I was in, in the Gango, in the Gango tree, I was, go, I went to, um, I was talking to a very, very wise old Swami. He was in his 80s, I don't know if he's still alive. Um, I felt he was an enlightened soul, at least uh, spiritually very advanced. And he said exactly the same thing and I burst out laughing. And that invited one of the worst scoldings I've got in my life. <laughs> I won't tell you here. But it's also a blessing because I went back to my heart and I wrote down the scolding. I still have it. Uh, the moment uh, he said, um, in the bathroom also the same Brahman is there. Oh, what he said to me, what provoked that scolding, that this, this thing was part of the scolding actually. What provoked the scolding was, he was saying, um, Brahman is the all-pervading reality. But remember the setting, this little hut, 10,000 foot in the feet high up in the Himalayas, with the Ganga, the Ganges flowing by fast, 200 feet below, surrounded by the other pine forests, with the glaciers coming down, magnificent scenery. I sort of felt that it's okay for him to speak about the joy and peace of Brahman. But, but you know, if you go to the... I've come from Calcutta, one of the crowdest. Uh, uh, so I said, ha, theek hai, well, it's all right. Lekin hum log to shahar mein rehte hai na, but we stay in cities, you know. I sort of just said it, said that. And that invited a very powerful scolding, part of which was this. He said, what? This itself shows that you are not serious about your sadhana. He says, uh, pramad karte ho, alasya karte ho. Pramad means straying away from the path. Alasya means laziness. 
And he says, uh, oh monk, he, he says actually, to be like this, it's better not to be a monk if you're like this. And then, then he said, where is Brahman? Not there. He is here in the mountains, here he is there in the cities where you live. He says, he is verily there in that bathroom. He said, <laughs> he used more foul language, but <laughs> <laughs> basically what he said was the rasgulla, the yeah. Bengali is the sweet they eat, the sweet which you eat, their Brahman is there. And what comes out in the, <laughs> that their, their Brahman is exactly there too. Where is Brahman not there? It is is, is net, existence. It is the very stuff of all your experience, consciousness. Everything good and bad is Brahman. Very powerful. It's unforgettable the way he told me. When you are sleeping it is Brahman. When you are awake it is Brahman. In the bathroom it is Brahman. Bajar mein Brahma. In the marketplace it is Brahman. Uh, Times Square, Brahman. Brahma hi Brahma, Paramatma hi Paramatma. Brahman alone is there. It's Brahman and Brahman alone. The Supreme Self and the Supreme Self alone. To jaise swapna mein swapna ka desh, swapna ka kaal, swapna ki vastu. Just as in your dream, you have the space in dream, you have the time in dream, the objects and people and the objects in dream. Swapna ka vyakti, people of, of your dreams. Swapna ka samman, the relationships in dreams. Swapna ka dharma dharma, the dharma and adharma in swapna, the good and the bad, good and the evil in your dreams. Swapna ke Brahma, Vishnu, Mahesh, if you meet Brahma and Vishnu and uh, Shiva in your, uh, God if you meet in your dream, even God if you meet in your dream. Swapna ke Nyaya, Vaisheshik, Sankhya, Yog, Mimangsa, Vedant, the philosophers you meet in your dreams. Yeah. The, uh, you met a logician, a Vedantin, a non-dualist teacher, huh? a Shunyavadi, Buddhist in your dreams. Jaise sab manaspandit hai, all of them are nothing but your mind. All of them, including God, including Vedanta, including all of that. Maya se man mein hi sab kuch banta hai. Just as by Maya alone everything appears in, in your mind, in dreams. Vaise hi, just like that. Jagrat, jagrat mein bhi man ka hi spandan hai. In this world also you are seeing all of these things. It's exactly that, no a little bit, not even a little bit different. Not even a little bit different. So, ah, very powerful, just like that. Well, just one little uh, addition here, a uh, little, little pointer here, is that uh, notice something. He should have said, just as in a dream the mind becomes everything, so in the waking state it is Brahman which becomes everything. But he didn't say that. He said, just as in your dream the mind creates your entire dream universe, Similarly, in the waking state, it is the mind which creates the entire waking state. In dream, by maya, mind creates the dream. In waking, by maya, mind creates the vibration of the mind. Mind alone shines forth as this universe. This doesn't seem to be exactly what Advaita was saying. Here is the difference between Gaurapada and other traditional Advaita. That's why Gaurapada, Mandukya is difficult. Why is it difficult? Remember, we have seen, already seen in the second chapter, Gaurapada does not make a distinction between waking and dreaming. It seems to say that there are three states, waking, dreaming, deep sleep, and underneath all of it, the fourth, Sturya. According to Gaudapada, actually, we saw in the second chapter, there are only two states. What are the two states? Dreaming and sleeping. Deep sleep is deep sleep, dreaming is dreaming, waking is also dreaming. But we say waking and dreaming are different. We have had this discussion earlier, long time ago. And objections, ten objections were taken up. Why waking is different from dreaming? And all ten were cut down. In the second chapter, Gaurapada deals with that. Give me any reason why you think the waking world is more real than the dream world. Whatever reason you gave. gave. Waking world is more um, concrete. The dream world seems to be vague. The waking world has uh, utility. The dream world does not have utility. The waking world uh, is shared by so many people. Dream world is not is private. So many objections you can give. Ten objections were taken up, and he showed none of them hold true. It's the same in the dream and then the waking too. So, from his point of view, he's writing from his point of view. From his point of view, the dream world and this waking world are at the same equal status. 
it is the vibration of the mind which generates a dream world. It's the vibration of the mind which generates a waking world. Manaspandana. Spandana means vibration or shining forth. Yes. Is there such a thing as crazy? In yeah. <laughs> yes, so this, this is called in Vedanta Drishti Srishti Vada. That means there are two ways of looking at it. Srishti Drishti Vada means the world exists and you come and see it. So there's a world and I'm born into it and I'm experiencing a world. A world exists outside you and you see it. That's how we look at the waking world. But we don't look at the dream world like that. Do we say the dream world was there? Now I'm going to enter it. Yeah. Have I, I'll go to sleep. I need to keep my uh, visa by the bedside because I'm going to enter the dream world now. Customs, immigration. No. There is no dream world apart from my mind. My mind alone imagines the entire dream world. The, the dream world is created by my mind. So from the dream world, the world of our dreams is called Drishti Srishti. Seeing itself is creation. Srishti means creation. You are seeing the dream is creation. You have a pizza in your dream. And then it's time you are waking up. Do you say that let me keep just a moment. Let me put the, 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 the uh, leftovers in the, fr uh, in the fridge. I will dream tomorrow and come and eat it. No. Because it doesn't exist when you, you are not dreaming it. But this waking world we say it exists whether we are seeing it or not. This is called realism. Gaudapada does not follow that. He says, this world also is, is uh, it exists only when you are experiencing it. There is no separate reality. So, it is true that Brahman alone appears as this world. And you are Brahman. Uh, through the mediation of when the mind is active, this world appears. He so, say, really quantum mechanics. Maybe, I don't know, so I am not going into that. So, he says that, um, notice one thing. Ignorance of the reality creates the appearance. Brahman, when you do not know Brahman, it appears to you as this world. And also one thing, when the mind is active, the world appears. When the mind is active, dream world appears. When the mind is active, waking world appears. When the mind is inactive, deep sleep, world disappears. Neither the object remains, nor the subject remains. And that's our daily experience. So he, he gives a central role to the mind, which he will develop slowly. That's why he's introducing the mind. Otherwise, he would have normally said, Brahman plus Maya is this world. Brahman through Maya appears as this world. He says, no, that's true. But the vibration of the mind, that is important. Yes. Uh, so Maharaj, according to Vedanta, the subtle body would not be dependent on, on gross body at all. There's no gross body, according to Vedanta. What you think of as the gross body, and there is no subtle body also, because Brahman alone exists. If you are asking, subtle body would not be dependent on, on gross body, what happens in your dream? Is the subtle body dependent on gross body? No. Yes. You think it's, you, now you are saying it's not. But when you are in the dream, do you feel that my mind is independent of my body? No. You feel that your mind is dependent on the body. Mind and body are com completely connected. You feel that in the dream. That's what you feel now also. So, that is his position. And then let, me, let us complete this. Then what is it that is shining forth as this world? Nothing but Brahman. Waking world is Brahman. Dream world is also Brahman. Brahman alone exists. Verse number 30. No. Yes, 30. Advayam cha dvaya bhasam Advayam cha dvaya bhasam Mana swapne na samshaya Mana swapne na samshaya Advayam cha dvaya bhasam Advayam cha dvaya bhasam Tatha jagran na samshaya Tatha jagran na samshaya Very beautiful, simple verse. The mind alone, the non-dual mind, by which he means, other than the mind, there is nothing in the dream. 
The mind alone appears as everything in the dream, the space of the dream, the time of the dream, the people in the dream, the events good and bad in the dream, the causality, the science and religion and superstition of the dream, all of that is nothing apart from the mind. It's not a second reality apart from the mind. Follow me? Not second, non-dual, advayam. Advayam cha dvayabhasam. That non-dual mind alone appears is the appearance of duality in dream. Dvaya bhasam, abhasa, appearance. Dvaya, duality. The appearance of duality is nothing but in reality it's the non-dual mind in the dream. Similarly, that much is, should be absolutely clear. Nobody should have a doubt there. It's common sense. It has nothing to do with Vedanta. Vedanta is just restating it in a strategic way so that you can use exactly the same statement for the waking state. Look, Advayam cha dvaya bhasam tatha jagran nasamshaya. Similarly, in this waking state also, it is that non-dual Brahman, existence consciousness bliss, which appears as this duality. It's an appearance of duality in the waking state. Nasamshaya. No doubt about it. There is no doubt that it is the non-dual mind appearing as the multiplicity of the dream. The appearance of duality in the dream. No doubt. Why no doubt? Because every day in the morning we wake up and we confirm this. All of that was just a dream. The good and the bad and the pleasant and the unpleasant. All of it, the remembered and forgotten. All of it I know one thing. It was just my mind. When I wake up, na samshaya, no doubt about it. Because I confirm it by my waking experience. Here also, there should be no doubt about it. In this waking state, while you are here, in this life itself, when you are leading this life, in this life, here existing, uh, with all the people and the time and the space and the good and the bad, it is that one non-dual reality. Na samshaya, don't allow this doubt to enter your mind. That confusion. So by the process of Shravana Manana Nididhyasana, by clarifying the teaching again and again, listening to it, thinking about it, clarifying all doubts, arguing it through, then when you have got clarity, stay with it till all doubts completely disappear. It, it's a fact. Look, what creates a problem? It's not that the dream creates a problem. In a dream, a bad dream, a nightmare, suffering. But what is the real problem there? The problem is we do not know it's a dream. If you saw exactly the same dream in a lucid bay, that you know it's a dream, I'm safe and sound in my bed, and you're running through Times Square and King Kong is chasing you, um, it's terrible, but you know it's a dream, then it would not be a problem. Would it be a problem? No. no. <coughs> Might be scary, but no more scary than a movie. So no more scary than a movie. What do you mean dream can be real? Don't bring up, if you are trying to say what I think you are trying to say, then I, all my efforts in two years have been total failure. <laughs> what are you trying to say? I'm saying that uh, the facts sometimes, past facts, it stays, exist in our mind. Sometimes after 14 years, 25 years, 35 years, that comes as a dream, then you verify, yes. It is exactly today's my morning dream. I had that incident. You should not and ask. That, that's the way sometimes poet and writer compose because that is a photographic memory. You cannot forget a single sentence that happened in your real life. It appeared in your dream. Look at your own language. It appeared in your dream. Did it happen in your dream? In the past, not now. It happened in the past, in, in your waking state, and you dreamt it now. Exactly. So is the dream real? A dream is never real. Na samshaya, this teacher says, do not be shaken by doubt. Uh, the regret and uh, whatever unpleasant thing happened in the past, we regret it. Look back at, at it with, uh, with sorrow and regret. Whatever nice thing happened in the past, we look back at look back at it with uh, with um, what is that called? We're trying to recall old things. Nostalgia. Uh, what is uh, something unpleasant expected in the future? You look forward to it. You, you, I mean, you look at it with anxiety, uneasiness. 
what you want and you expect in future look forward to it with eagerness both are dreams just as your dream is false looking back to the past it's gone right now when you look no it, don't nod your head stay here and look back look anything you the, the, the trick of the memory is when we look back upon what we think was in our past we think we are recalling real things and the mind is so tuned to it that when you recall things it seems it feels like it is real it's not real i give you this example you can perform this mental experiment right now you see the waking world seems real and the dream world seems false the reason is you are comparing the present waking world with your dreams which is already gone but that is not a fair comparison you are taking out a memory of a dream and comparing it with this present waking world then that, that memory seems unreal this seems real but what is a fair comparison is get a memory of your waking life and a memory of a dream compare the true memories in your mind you will see they'll seem equally false you ate a pizza in your dream and you had eaten a pizza for um, supper last week sometime now compare eating the pizza uh, in your supper and compare eating the pizza in in your dream you will see both of them feel the same memories neither feels more real than the other now now in fact the definition of dream shankaracharya says swakale satya vadbhati prabodhe sati asad bhavet during its own time it feels real waking up from it it feels distant unreal insubstantial that's the definition of a dream that's exactly true of our memories of our past waking also yeah hmm. with respect to mind there is no now anyway right i mean there is no present there is no present You know, you're talking about uh, uh, logically that every moment is fleeting. The moment you think about, it's already gone. In that sense, you're talking about that, it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So let's not go there. Just see what what feels like present to you. Right now, it feels like present. No, you're not convinced. <laughs> <laughs> you think this is a memory? You're living in a memory right now. <laughs> no. Whatever, wherever you are, there is the presence. So he says. forget the dreams of the past and the unsubstantial insubstantial phantoms of the future they are tricks of the mind there is only the living presence and here it's one non dual existence consciousness bliss with an appearance of duality no doubt it's like living in the dream consciously or lucidly so he says that and this non dual knowledge when you come to this he says this advayam non dual knowledge this is the whole purpose in fact what happens when you live like this in this living present you see everything as that one non dual reality which you are so it's another beautiful verse instead of taking the trouble to memorize it i'll quote it to you um when you live like that that is one non dual reality right now and i am that non dual reality what happens the world still appears jaisa hai waise that means as it is nothing has to be changed here there's a beautiful verse and actually i had heard this verse long ago from a great non dualist teacher of our order who has passed away now swami mukhyananda so he was a quite a character he had this little beard and uh, he had a little bamboo fan with which he used to fan himself all the time and if you ask for his blessings he would hit you on the head with the fan <laughs> that was his blessings we all everybody knows him in belur mat so he has written good books on shankara and advaita i had asked him what is the result of all of this and he had quoted this verse to me at that time i found it again so this verse is what happens when you are live like that sampurnam jagadeva nandana vanam this entire universe becomes the Nandana Vanam is the gardens of heaven. This entire uh, universe becomes a garden of heaven for you. Sarve Vriksha Kalpadruma, where all the trees are the wish-fulfilling trees. Eh? Kalpaturu. Ganga Varim Samastha Varini, where all the rivers are nothing other than Ganga for you. 
um, punya samasta kriya, whatever you do is a holy action. Vacha prakrita samskrita shruti shiro, whatever you say, prakrita means in ordinary language or in Sanskrit, you don't have to say it in Sanskrit anyway. If you say in Sanskrit or in ordinary language, in English or any ordinary language, whatever you say, shruti shira, it is all your speech is Vedanta. It does not mean you're quoting Mandukya Karika all the time. It means because you see the reality, whatever you express will be the truth. It will really be the truth. And anybody else, it might be the greatest scholar of, of, of Vedanta, it might be the greatest scientist, it might be the most believing man in the world, whatever they say is false. But they are not reporting the truth. You are seeing the truth and talking about it. So your speech, all that you say will be Vedanta. Shruti Shira means, Shruti means Veda. Shira means the crown. So the crown of the Veda is Upanishad. The Upanishad is Vedanta. So Shruti Shira means Vedanta. Varanasi Medini and the earth is Benares, the holy city of Benares. All water, all rivers are Ganga, all acts are holy acts, all speech is Vedanta and the universe is turned into the heaven, gardens of the heavens and all, where all the trees are the wish-fulfilling trees and uh, the earth itself becomes Varanasi, the holy city of Benares. Sarva vasthitir tasya vastu vishaya drishte parabrahmani. In whatever way that this realized person says, stays, this is the life this person leads. Drishte parabrahmani. Once Brahman is realized. Once Brahman is realized. <coughs> and that realization takes a moment, a breakthrough of one moment. This teacher he says very powerfully. All the years that have passed, imagine the story of Narada, all the years that passed in Narada's dream, all of that, those 12 years which passed, his marriage, the children and ups and downs of his samsara and the terrible tragedy which struck him, all of that, years and years of this, his life story, vividly experienced, is that more powerful? Or is that one instant where he sees the feet of Krishna and looks up and he says, Krishna says, you have been gone for quite half an hour, you know. Is that instant more powerful? That one instant is more powerful than the 12 years of a dream. A thousand lifetimes of living in ignorance, they disappear just like that in one instant of Brahma Jnana. Just that one breakthrough is necessary. Sri Ramakrishna is to give the example. A room which has been in darkness for a thousand years. When you light a torch there, does the darkness dispel? It's been dark for a very long time. It's taking some time to dispel. It'll, you have to work at it. No. It, dis, it goes in a flash. He says a mountain. Uh, Girish Ghosh used to weep. I have committed so many sins. I have committed a mountain of sins. And Sri Ramakrishna said, Ogo to Tulor Pahar. It's a mountain of cotton. Light the fire of Brahman, it will burn up in a flash. Yeah. So, it's, it's like that. And this is the purpose of all spirituality. There's another verse, I'll quote that and I'll end. It's a nice verse, which shows the importance of realization. This is the purpose for which all of it is there. Our, indeed, our entire secular life, all our religious, artistic, scientific quest, all of religion also is meant for this realization. So he says, the verse says, Snatam tena samastatita salire. That one has, has bathed in all the waters of all the pilgrimages, in the holy dip, in the holy uh, rivers. Dattacha sarva dhanam has, has donated all wealth which can be donated. Yajnanam cha krita sahasram ayut. Uh, so has has performed a, a thousand fire sacrifices, yajna. Ayutam devascha sampujita and has worshipped all the gods of all the religions. Trilokyascha samudrita uh, and has helped the three worlds and has been of, uh, has helped everybody. Swapitaras trilokya pujyo hyaso and has worshipped all the ancestors of his past. That means all the holy acts you can think of in religion. Who is this person? Yasya Brahma vichare na kshana papi sthaidiyam manaprapnuyat. Who for even one second 
has attained the stillness in Brahman. The mind has become still in Brahman for even one second. Born of this constant trying, investigating Brahma Vichara, which we are doing here. By this constantly following this, for one flash, for one second also, if your mind becomes stilled in this, it is equal to the result of all those religious observances. This is the purpose for which religion exists. This is the purpose for which civilization exists. This is the purpose for which life itself exists, according to Vedanta. Um, what's next? He has concluded a, a topic. Here, in 30th verse, he concludes a topic. What's the topic? Using logic and appropriate quotations from the Upanishads. He has shown that Brahman is non-dual. How has he shown that? By showing that there is no real creation of Jiva Jagat, of the universe and sentient beings. There is no real creation. Apparently it is created. If there is no real creation, Brahman is not really the creator. Brahman is not really the cause. If Brahman is not really the cause, then Brahman is beyond cause and effect. Brahman is of course not an effect and Brahman is not really the cause. So Brahman is beyond cause and effect. That beyond cause and effect is non-duality. So by denying the causality of Brahman, he, through quotations from the Upanishads and through logic and reasoning and examples, he has proved that Brahman is non-dual. This topic is finished. Now he has introduced the next, next topic already. Notice he introduced the importance of the mind. The mind vibrating creates the entire uh, dream universe. And he says quite controversially, it is the mind vibrating which creates your physical universe also, this waking universe also. So what do you do with the mind? When you are in deep sleep, no universe. In deep samadhi, no universe. But that does not help. Are, you, are we supposed to be in sleep, uh, asleep all the time? Is that what Vedanta is telling? Fall asleep, go into coma? That would solve our problem, but only temporarily. Because you will come out of coma. And it will be very unpleasant. Uh, and if the body dies, then you will be reborn in something else with no coma at all. And then it will be pretty bad. Samadhi. If you can attain samadhi after a great effort, but samadhi is attained and lost. You can go into it and come out of it also. In this world, living in this world, what do you do with the mind? Because the mind will vibrate and create this multiplicity. So, next topic will be how to manage the mind. What is how to spiritualize the mind and thereby spiritualize our world experience. You know, you know what he is going to say. By realizing that I am Brahman, then this whole thing is, as he just said, this whole universe becomes a, the garden of heaven and so on, etc, etc. So that topic is going to start and he has called it a very nice name, Amani Bhava, no mind. I gave a talk on this, Amani Bhava. So this is the next few verses which will start. Uh, how to make the mind, no mind. Not by falling asleep, not by going into coma, not even by Samadhi. With eyes open, with ears open. Walking, talking, doing your work, all of this. Do this and yet it is one Brahman alone. So that Amani Bhava, that, that topic, it's a very wonderful topic. I gave one full lecture on this one, um, a, few, a few months ago. No mind. So let's stop here. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Rupanamastu